right, cool. Yeah, thank you for the introduction. Uh, yeah, so yeah, I'd like to thank Energy Futures Lab and Connor for the opportunity for me to present about my research. So yes, as uh, Connor mentioned, the topic today is on aircraft control climate effects and mitigation. Uh, it's being done uh, primarily by me and by Dr. Mark Stadler, which is the head of the Transport and Environment, uh, Environment Laboratory. So yes, as uh, we've mentioned, it's a bit technical, but uh, I'll try to try as much as I can to simplify uh, what I have so that it's uh, yeah, easy to understand. Okay, so here's the outline of the talk. So there are three main sections. The first part, uh, I will talk about the basics of contrails, uh, mainly the science and the physics behind it uh, on our current understanding on the contrail formation properties and how it affects the climate. I'll then move on to the second, second section where I look at the set of conditions uh, where contrails are strongly warming and cooling based on a case study in the North Atlantic, which is our current ongoing research. Finally, I'll uh, discuss briefly about the potential control mitigation solutions that are currently available and proposed and its limitations. So, all right, we, we all know that aviation emissions consist of both CO2 and non-CO2 components, uh, such as NOx, nitrogen oxide, particulate matter, water vapor, and sulfur. And here in this graph, uh, the bars denote the climate forcing for each pollutant. So uh, the metric used here is the effective radiative forcing, which I will talk more about the metric in the next few slides. Uh, here, yeah, we see that the control climate forcing uh, could be higher or comparable uh, than the radiative forcing of aviation's cumulative CO2 emissions since in inception, uh, but with very large uncertainty bounds. So what are contrails? Contrails are line-shaped clouds that form behind an aircraft when the atmosphere is supersaturated or and at low temperatures under favorable atmospheric conditions. So the aircraft soot or non-volatile particulate matter emissions it, uh, that comes from the exhaust of an uh, aircraft, it primarily acts as a condensation nuclei uh, for control formation. So to simplify things, if the atmosphere is supersaturated, meaning that the air contains more water vapor than it can hold, you'll see that the water, vape, water droplets uh, forming on the surface of the soot particles. Think about it uh, as an example, uh, if, you, if you're taking a hot shower, you can see the condensation of water on the walls. And in this cases, uh, the soot particles act as a surface for water condensation. So once you form these water droplets, uh, these water droplets subsequently freeze to form control ice crystals. And there you, there you get it, like uh, you, you, you get control formation. So the control properties and lifetime, they are primarily influenced by two main factors. The aircraft uh, non-volatile particulate matter number emissions index. So this number emissions index is the number of particles emit, emitted per kilogram of fuel burn. And it is also influenced by the local atmospheric conditions, such as the winds, which affects how the controls spread over time. The humidity uh, influence like how the uh, how long the control would live, uh, etc. So here is an example uh, of how the control, uh, how the aircraft number emissions index affects the different control properties. And what we see here is that for the control ice particle number, so the higher the aircraft NVPM uh, number emissions index, you get more control ice particle number. So it's so fairly le linearly co correlated above a certain threshold. So if you have more uh, aircraft emissions, uh, particle number emissions, you get more control ice particle numbers as we've seen previously. And the fixed humidity in the atmosphere has to be distributed to more particles. Therefore, you see increase in number emissions index, uh, you get a reduction in the control ice particle radius. Uh, 
the same time, uh, again, a higher uh, particle number emissions means that the optical depth of the control is higher. So to simplify things, the optical optical depth. So if you have a high optical depth, control optical depth, it means that the controls are thicker and more visible. For example, the optical depth of young controls can be up to 10 times larger than the age controls. So next time, if you look up uh, above uh, on this, onto the sky, you can see that young controls tend to be a lot thicker and it's a lot easier to spot relative to uh, age controls. So here's an example of the control evolution and it's tracked by satellites. So initially, initially you can see there's a, some coil shaped controls likely formed by a milita military aircraft. They were initially identified off the east coast of the UK. And over time, you can see uh, that the controls gradually lose their line shape structure and becomes indistinguishable from natural surface. And after 10 hours, yeah, it's very hard to distinguish it, uh, yeah, whether, whether it's a control or a natural, natural clouds. And it also spreads to a very large coverage area after 10 hours. As you can see here at the bottom right plot. Now, here, here's the interesting question on like how, so how does control, how, how does control impact the environment? So there are two components essentially. The first component, during the day, controls reflect incoming solar radiation back to space and can cause a cooling effect. But not, it, it does not necessarily mean that controls will be cooling during the day, but it can be cooling. But at the same time, you have this warming component as well, where it acts as a greenhouse effect. Uh, controls act as a greenhouse effect where it traps and re-emits parts of the outgoing long wave radiation back to the surface of the earth uh, at all times. So you have this warming component of controls as well. So this, this slide is a bit technical, uh, but bear with me for, bear with me for a while, <laughs> I'll make it simple. We have, uh, so I'm gonna introduce you two different metrics that are generally used to quantify the control climate forcing. The first one is the radiative forcing. It is the change in the instantaneous energy flux over a defined area. It has units of watts per meter squared. And the defined area could be as small as the control coverage area or as large as the globe. So let me give you an example. In the previous slide, we see that there's two components in the control climate forcing, a warming effect and a cooling effect. So here you can see, imagine that controls reflect around one watt per meter squared of the incoming solar radiation back to space. So this is the cooling effect. But at the same time, it traps around three watts per meter squared of the outgoing long wave radiation back to the surface of the earth, causing a warming effect. So the net imbalance uh, is the net control radiative forcing. So that's, uh, that's about two watts per meter squared. So essentially, this is uh, the radiative forcing metric. You also have the control energy forcing metric. So this is the cumulative energy that is trapped by the atmosphere. It trapped in the atmosphere by the control throughout its lifetime. So it's usually used to quantify the control climate forcing that arise from uh, individual flights. So here is an example on how we calculate the control energy forcing. So it's calculated by multiplying the local control radiative forcing, which is the change in energy flux divided by the control area, and uh, multiplied by the control dimensions, the length and the width, and you integrate this uh, over its lifetime. So the key difference between radiative forcing and energy forcing is that for short-lived controls, you can have a very large radiative forcing, but a very small energy forcing because it has a very short lifetime. But controls with a large control energy forcing tends to be long-lived. For example, they could have a mean age of, age of over 10 hours, and it covers a very large coverage area. So even though you might have a very small radiative forcing uh, for long-lived controls, but uh, uh, the warming effect and the climate, yeah, the climate impacts is exaggerate, exaggerated by the large 
lifetime and the coverage area. So now, now you have the basics of the contrail formation properties and how it influenced the environment. Now I'm just going to talk through uh, the set of conditions that causes strongly and uh, warming and cooling contrails over the North Atlantic. So this is uh, an ongoing research that we have, and we expect to publish these results in a journal paper in the coming weeks. So yes, uh, briefly go, uh, going through on the research methodology on the data sets and the models that we used. So uh, the, we use the air traffic data over the North Atlantic uh, for five years. So this is kindly provided by the UK air traffic uh, navigation service provider, NATS. So this is our simulation domain where we look at the Gander and Shanwick Oceanic Area Control Center. You can see here uh, flights in the morning. There is a eastbound traffic, a peak in the morning where eastbound traffic, uh, eastbound air traffic flows from America to Europe. And during the evening, the, the traffic uh, goes through the, the other way around where it returns back to uh, North America. So with this air traffic data set, we estimate the fuel consumption for individual flights uh, using a model, using the BANA model that's provided by Eurocontrol. With the fuel consumption, we estimate the emissions such as the carbon dioxide, the nitrogen oxide, and the non-volatile particulate matter number emissions index, which in our previous slides, we, uh, we've seen that uh, it affects the control properties. And to, together with meteorological data from the European Centre for Medium Range Weather Forecast, we input the emissions and meteorological data to a control model to estimate the control dimensions, the properties, for example, the ice particle radius and the optical depth, which, which I've mentioned earlier, and the control lifetime, as well as the control radiative forcing and energy forcing. And with that, uh, we infer like, what are the potential implications to mitigate the control climate forcing. So briefly going through the uh, control model. So this is the control service prediction model, COSIP, which is a state-of-the-art control model that's developed by the German Aerospace Center. So essentially, it simulates the control segments that, uh, that are produced uh, by individual flights from the formation to its end of life. And here you can see that this is an example of the outputs, the results of the COSIP control model over a different domain. It's not the North Atlantic, it's over Europe, where you can see how the controls form and evolve over time. So the blue, the blue dots uh, uh, imply that the controls are cooling, and the red dots, uh, as you can see right now, uh, infer that the controls are warming. So there are different factors that influence the, uh, whether or not the control is warming or cooling, as I will describe in the next few slides. Uh, but first, yes, uh, we look into the multi-year statistics over the North Atlantic domain. So here uh, we can see uh, the results from, the aggregated results from 2016 to 2020. Between 2016 and 2019, we can see that the total flight distance in this domain increased by approximately 3.05% uh, 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 per annum per year. But at the same time, uh, you see the fuel consumption and CO2 emissions increase at a slightly larger rate, higher rate at about 3.13% per annum. So you might, you might thought that, okay, uh, the aircraft technology and uh, the industry should be more efficient over time as we roll out new aircraft types and more efficient aircraft types. Yes, this is the case, but over the North Atlantic, we also see that the aircraft types that are being used are generally, generally getting larger, so you, you, you have more capacity. Uh, and because of that, uh, the aircraft mass is increasing. Therefore, you increase the overall fuel consumption relative to the, at a higher rate relative to the flight distance. For the nitrogen oxide emissions, NOx, uh, increase in this domain in North Atlantic, it increases at a fast at a, the fastest rate relative to CO2 and the flight distance. The reason for that is because the as the aircraft gets more efficient over time, uh, the engine 
uh, combustor uh, operates at a, a higher flame temperature. And the, these uh, higher flame temperature uh, promotes the, uh, it makes it more efficient in terms of the fuel consumption. But you have a trade off where uh, higher flame temperature admits, emits more nitrogen oxide. But on the other hand, you see this control uh, net radiative forcing over the domain of the North Atlantic in red. You can see that the interannual variability or the year on year variability of the control service net radiative forcing can be plus, up to plus or minus 27% much larger than uh, the, the pollutants. And it has a stronger dependence on the local meteorological conditions uh, than the total flight distance traveled. Not all contrails are created equal. So some can be cooling and others can be strongly warming. And in this figure, uh, you can see this is the cumulative uh, annual contrail energy forcing for the North Atlantic and on the y-axis, the x-axis is the percentage of flights that contributes to the control, the cumulative control energy forcing. The main point uh, I would like to make here is that it, only 12% of all flights in this region accounts for 80% of the control, uh, annual control energy forcing. And this is consistent uh, over uh, the different years. Why, why is this the case? So there are four main factors that influence the control climate forcing, which we will go through in detail. You have the seasonal effects, uh, winter, spring, summer, and autumn. You have diurnal effects, uh, for example, uh, the time of day. Uh, the background cloud fuels, uh, for example, if there's natural, servants, natural clouds present uh, in the domain. And you also like, we've, as we've seen in the, previous, uh, in the previous section, that the aircraft type also influences how the non-volatile particulate uh, matter emissions and how it influences the control properties. So in the next few slides, I'll define strongly warming contrails as the flights uh, that have uh, the control energy forcing that's above the 99th percentile. So it's the top 1% of the most warming contrails uh, over five years in the domain. And strongly cooling contrails um, is, is the top 1% of the cooling controls that we've recorded uh, that's provided by the control model. Looking at the seasonal effects uh, in terms of uh, the total flight distance in over the North Atlantic, you can see that air traffic tends to be at a minimum uh, over, during the winter time, winter months, uh, so around January and end of the year, and it tends to peak in the summer. At the same time here, uh, what you see, what you see here is uh, on the y-axis is p, p contrail. So this is the proportion of flight distance that form contrails. So during the winter, you see approx uh, approximately 20 to 30 percent of the flight distance tends to form contrails, and during the summer, uh, it goes down to around uh, to a minimum of about 10 to 15 percent of flight distance forming contrails. You also have uh, during the winter, you also see that the control lifetime uh, defined by, yeah, by the mean control age tends to be a, a higher uh, yeah, during the winter at about, well, 3.2 hours. Whereas in the summer, it tends to be uh, the control lifetime tends to be shorter at about 2.5 hours. So as a result of the an increased control formation and lifetime during the winter, you see that the control net radiative forcing over the North Atlantic tends to be largest uh, in the winter, which is about well 300 milliwatts per meter squared, and tends to be approximately constant during the spring, summer, and autumn. So this is an example of the spatial coverage of the ice supersaturated regions uh, for one time slice in the North Atlantic uh, from top down. So essentially, uh, it, what it shows that contrails, it, it shows that yeah, contrails tends to form inside these regions, but yeah, it won't form outside outside the regions that are not super saturated with respect to ice. And here uh, in this figure, you see the same thing where the y-axis is the, the you see you see it from uh, the altitude perspective where 
the y-axis is the altitude over the x-axis over time. And the color bar uh, signifies the, ice, the coverage of the ice supersaturated regions uh, in the North Atlantic. Again, uh, in the winter, in winter months, you see that there's a large horizontal uh, control uh, ice supersaturated region uh, coverage area. So this increases the proportion of flight distance forming controls during the winter. So in other words, the color bar becomes more red uh, during the winter months. And at, at the same time, you also see uh, the, it becomes thicker uh, where in the winter months. So this thicker vertical extension increases the control lifetime. Think about it where the control ice particles sediment down. So in the winter, you, ha you have a thicker vertical extension. So it, it reduces the probability of the control ice particles to encounter warm and dry air. Uh, for it to evaporate and uh, sublimate. Therefore, you tend to get a, a larger control lifetime during the winter. What you see here is the probability density function of the uh, flights with strongly warming contrails in red and flights with strongly cooling contrails in blue and all the control forming flights in the, over the North Atlantic. So as expected, strongly warming contrails tend to form during the winter. Oops, uh, yeah, by the day of year here in winter. And up to, you can have up to 100% of the flight distance uh, that form contrails. And on the other hand, you see that strongly cooling contrails tends to form in the spring and the autumn because the conditions are more favorable for a longer control lifetime relative to the summer. So that was the seasonal effects. Now uh, we are looking at the diurnal effects where this figure here is the Contrasurus net radiative forcing over the North Atlantic in 2019. So the y-axis is the uh, day of year uh, for 2019 and the x-axis is by the time of day. The color bar here signals the Contrasurus net radiative forcing. So essentially here you see a very clear diurnal effect the, uh, where the control uh, surface net radiative forcing tends to be at a minimum during daylight hours. You get about 200 milliwatts per meter squared of the net radiative forcing that's uh, induced by the control surface. And you tend to get a maximum net radiative forcing at dawn and dusk as the sun rises and as the sun sets, so it rises to about 385 milliwatts per meter squared. And one of the reasons for this is it's caused by the peak air traffic activity in this region. So if you recall uh, in, in the animation of the North Atlantic traffic, you get a peak, uh, from a, a peak in air traffic from America to Europe in the morning, so at dawn. And at dusk, the traffic reverses where uh, traffic uh, flows from Europe back to America and you get this peak at, uh, during the dusk. So you, you then you move into the night where you get a lower control net radiative forcing. And the reason for that is because the air traffic tends to be at a minimum uh, in this region. And some of the controls that form uh, during the PM peak uh, have sublimated. You remember the mean control age is about three hours. So even during the day, you, you tend to see very large variations where the controls uh, can be strongly warming here or strongly cooling during the day. And uh, they're part of the reason for that. Uh, we'll go through the, the potential possible reasons in the next few slides. So Again, this is the probability density function of the flights with strongly warming and cooling contrails by time of day and the contrail age. So here we see that flights with strongly warming contrails, as expected, they tend to form uh, after 3 p.m., between 3 p.m. and 4 a.m. UTC time, with a mean contrail age of approximately seven hours. So what it means that, yeah, it uh, means that the contrails form late in the evening and it persists through the night where you don't have the cooling component and you just have the uh, warming component as we've described in the, the basics of the control climate forcing. On the other hand, 
you get strongly cooling contrails that tends to form between 6 a.m. and 3 p.m. Uh, UTC time with a mean contrail age of about five hours. What this means is that the contrails tends to maximize its cooling effect during the day and sublimates, uh, and sublimates before nightfall. So these, this is the di diurnal effect. So the third factor is the background cloud fields. So the contrail climate forcing, it's also dependent on not whether the contrail is formed above or below natural clouds. So in this case, uh, the contrails are forming above low level water clouds and in, the, yeah, in this case uh, the incoming solar direct radiation from the sun it would have been reflected by the low level water clouds whether or not the contrail is present or not therefore uh, the cooling effect the cooling component of the contrails that form above uh, low level clouds uh, are generally close to zero uh, because uh, and uh, because the cooling com component is close to zero, uh, the, the contrails that form above low level water clouds tends to be more warming. At the same time, uh, this contrails act as an additional layer where it traps uh, the outgoing long wave radiation uh, back and re emits it back to the surface of the Earth. So you, it, it, to summarize, you, you lose the cooling component of the contrail but you still retain the warming component. Therefore, contrails that form above low level water clouds tends to be more warming. If we look at this in reverse, uh, the, if the contrails form below high level cirrus, then the warming component doesn't make much of a difference because in any case, the outgoing long wave radiation would have been trapped by the natural cirrus, whether or not a contrail is present or not. Therefore, the long wave, uh, the long wave or the warming component becomes uh, small. At the same time, you get this additional contrail layer that further reflects the incoming solar radiation uh, back to back to space, and you keep the you keep the cooling component, and the warming component becomes negligible. So the takeaway message is that contrails that form below high level cirrus tends to be cooling tends to have a higher cooling effect. As you can see here in terms of the probability density function, so what you see here on the x-axis is the albedo. So if the surface of the Earth, for example, if uh, in a polar region where it's whiter, uh, the albedo tends to be uh, larger, or if you have low level water clouds as well, uh, this is captured by the albedo, the larger albedo value. So if the contrails that form above over the ocean in a cloud-free conditions, the albedo tends to be smaller uh, because the ocean surface tends to be darker. As, as expected, yeah, uh, contrails that form uh, above uh, low-level clouds tends to be warming, as indicated by the high albedo, while contrails that form below high-level cirrus clouds uh, tends to be cooling, as, exp uh, as indicated here by this tau cirrus term, which is the optical depth of the natural cirrus above the contrail. So on the fourth factor, uh, uh, this is the aircraft, uh, the contrail climate forcing is also dependent on the aircraft type. So more specifically, the uh, NVPM number emissions index, which is the particle emissions, uh, particle emitted per kilogram of fuel burn. So this is dependent on the aircraft and truss settings and the engine type. You can see that the NVPM uh, number emissions index, the, the particle number emissions, it can range between uh, five or it can be five order. It can range yeah, the vari variability is about five orders of magnitude from 10 to the 11 to 10 to the 16 kilograms uh, particles per kilogram of fuel burn. So what to summarize, yeah, what we see here is that aircraft that, that are powered by this Rolls-Royce Phase 5 rich quench lean combustor, which uh, takes up about 23% of flights, tends to uh, are responsible for 43% of the strongly warming contrails and 17% of the cooling contrails. So this uh, engine type, this Phase 5 rich quench lean combustor, yeah, it, it powers the Airbus A350 and Airbus 380 as well as the Boeing 787s.
yeah, the reason for that is because, as you can see, the number emissions index for this engine type uh, tends to be high. So it tends to be close to 10 to the upper range of this NVPM, which is about 10 to the 15 uh, particles per kilogram of fuel burn. So in, in, to summarize, this engine tends to emit more uh, soot and particle number emissions. So in particular, for, the, for this one aircraft type, the Airbus A380, which is also powered by the Phase 5 rich quench lean combustor, it, it accounts for 2.4% of all flights, but it's responsible for 35% of the strongly warming contrails and 11% of the strongly cooling contrails. So why is this the case? So it's a bit technical for this slide, but uh, yeah, just to summarize, if you increase uh, the NVPM, the particle number emissions per flight distance, the control ice particles tends to be smaller uh, because a fixed uh, humidity in the atmosphere is distributed to more particles. Because the particles are smaller, the sedimentation rate uh, of the particles decreases. Therefore, you, have, you tend to have a larger control lifetime with, with a smaller particle. Or smaller particle sizes. At the same time, with smaller particles, you tend to increase the control optical depth, so it becomes thicker. And optically thicker contrails tends to increase the magnitude and variability of the control energy forcing. Uh, therefore, if the contrails uh, form, uh, let's say, during the night, you tend to have uh, a larger warming effect. But uh, if it forms uh, during the day, you can equally have a cooling effect, but the net effect is uh, an increase in the magnitude of the control energy forcing per flight distance. So there are four main factors that I've uh, described that could influence the conditions, uh, co uh, conditions that influence uh, whether or not controls are strongly warming or cooling. So it's the seasonal effects, diurnal effects, the background cloud fields, and the aircraft non-volatile uh, uh, particulate matter emissions. So now you have a basic understanding on the uh, control climate forcing. You might ask, uh, like, what are the potential control mitigation solutions, right? Given that the radiative forcing of control cirrus could be equal uh, or higher than the radiative forcing of the control uh, of the carbon dioxide emissions uh, of aviation, therefore something needs to be done. There are three control mitigation solutions. The first one is that you could uh, you could have uh, cleaner burning engines, uh, and in essence, you can see here, and uh, which is the previous slide, it works in reverse. So if you have a lower number NVPM, number emissions index, or the yeah number per flight distance traveled, you tend to reduce the control energy forcing for the same mechanisms that I've described earlier. But uh, for con uh, to adopt this strategy. Uh, it tends to have limitations as well because it, it is a long-term solution. It's a long-term solution where the aircraft tends to have a long lead time. That it has typically have a life cycle of 20 years. So it's going to take a while uh, to renew the fleet and design uh, engines that are the engines that emit less NVPM number per flight distance. Second, the second uh, potential mitigation solution is uh, the use of sustainable aviation fuels. So there's this recent research uh, from the German Aerospace Center, where it shows that the use of sustainable aviation fuels uh, can reduce the uh, NVPM number emissions index. Uh, so the particle emissions, you can reduce it by about 50 to 70%. And this, uh, again, as we've shown uh, for reasons uh, in the previous slide, it reduces the control optical depth and the control climate forcing. However, you have a trade-off because the sustainable aviation fuel tends to emit more water vapor emissions. You could make yeah, the localized um, air more humid and increase the amount of control formation. So you get a higher control formation at the expense of the a lower control climate forcing per flight distance. Or per, con yeah, uh, per control distance. So, you, you, yeah, we need to assess this trade off, and this is what we are doing right now uh, over the North Atlantic uh, domain. At the same time, uh, we also know that the uh, use of sustainable aviation fuels uh, tends to be more expensive. And at the moment, uh, less than 1% of the global jet fuel supply 
is on uh, is being used uh, consists of sustainable aviation fuels. So could we could we uh, be smarter on this, where we target the limited amount of uh, SAF supply uh, during the winter or certain times of the day, where controls uh, where the control climate forcing tends to be the largest, uh, based on the case study over the North Atlantic. So this is the question uh, that we don't know, and we are in the process of quantifying this right now. The third, uh, the third potential uh, strategy is flight diversions. So earlier, uh, in, in over the North Atlantic, uh, we see that around 12% of the flights are responsible for 80% of the annual control energy forcing. What if we could target these flights and uh, uh, target these flights where we uh, shift the uh, cruising altitude by plus or minus 2,000 feet. At the same time, because you're only targeting a small subset of flights, you could minimize the disruptions to air traffic management. So what you see here in the animation uh, is the result from our earlier and smaller study over the Japanese domain uh, over six weeks. You can see that uh, uh, here we have the ice supersaturated regions, ISR, how, how it uh, affects over time. The green dots are the freshly formed contrails, and the blue, the blue dots here are the surviving contrails. So essentially, the takeaway message here is that you can see that a small change in cruising altitude of like plus or minus 2,000 feet, you can lead to significant differences in the control coverage area and lifetime. And according to the Japanese paper that we've published in 2020, if we divert just 1.7% of the flights, we can reduce the control energy forcing by about 59% uh, with a very small fuel penalty of 0.01%. That's, that's the uh, over the Japanese domain. What about the North Atlantic domain? So because the North Atlantic domain, uh, you have a lack of radar coverage, you tend, uh, you be, uh, the air traffic uh, navigation, uh, air traffic service provider tends to design this organized track uh, structure. Uh, so, so it tends to be fixed uh, where the flights tends to follow one, one, of the, uh, one of the organized track structure and it shouldn't deviate. Uh, so it should stick at the organized track structure that's planned by the air traffic navigation service provider. So could we organize, should, could we design this OTS so that it's optimized to minimize both the fuel consumption and control energy forcing? So this is, these are questions that we, we don't know, we, we, we haven't quantified yet. And could we also design the track structure uh, to take into account the seasonal variations uh, in winter, the winter conditions, diurnal conditions, or minimize the flight distance above low level clouds? Or you could have like a more extreme solution where you reschedule flights so that it forms during the day. But this again could have uh, significant disruptions to the Air, uh, traffic schedule, the airline schedule. So it might not be feasible, but again, it remains to be quantified. But at the same time, uh, the limitations of these flight diversion strategies is that it, uh, you need to account for uncertainties because uh, yeah, yeah, you have large meteorological uncertainties in the humidity and winds. And we must make sure that uh, when we divert flights, we don't incur uh, too much of a fuel penalty where uh, you minimize the control energy forcing at the expense of an increased carbon dioxide emissions, which tends to remain in the atmosphere for uh, at least 100 years. So here, here we have it. Uh, there's, three, uh, there's three potential control mitigation solutions. And to summarize uh, the presentation here is that the control radiative forcing could be higher than the radiative forcing of aviation's cumulative CO2 emissions since its inception, but with large uncertainties. We, we saw that controls can persist, spread, and evolve uh, into control service as indistinguishable from natural service. There are four main factors that influence the control climate forcing. The seasonal and di diurnal effects. Uh, you see like the change, change in the background cloud fuels, whether or not the controls form above or below the natural service, affects uh, the control climate forcing. You also see that, uh, that uh, the aircraft specific, uh, aircraft -specific uh, non volatile particulate matter emissions also affect the control climate forcing. Uh, 
The three potential control mitigation solutions is uh, where we can use cleaner burning engines. We could also assess uh, how the sustainable aviation fuels, uh, if it's possible to reduce the uh, control climate forcing as well, and flight diversion strategies uh, by targeting a small subset of flights and changing, changing their trajectories. But again, each of these three mitigation solutions uh, have their limitations and it, the uncertainties has to be quantified, which we are, which is ongoing research at the moment. So with that, I uh, pass it back to Connor to see if there's any potential questions uh, from the audience. Well, thank you very much indeed for that uh, presentation, Roger. Really interesting stuff. There's a couple of questions coming in there and, and uh, just to say to anybody else who would like to get questions in, um to that you can do that through the the q a box and um, maybe just to get us started could you speak a little bit more about the the fuel penalty that you mentioned um in terms of what what is the the sort of extra cost of of moving a flight up or down in you know by um in altitude okay so moving a flight up or down uh it depends the fuel penalty it depends on the ambient uh wind conditions so if you go up by 2,000 feet, you might encounter headwinds, and therefore this increases the fuel penalty. If uh, you divert the flights laterally, so rather than moving up or down, you move it east or west, or up, uh, north and south, uh, you could increase the total flight distance, and this again incurs the fuel penalty. But at, at the moment, uh, it, it is possible to divert flights to minimize both the contrail energy forcing and the fuel penalty and the fuel consumption, because the air traffic uh, over certain uh, over most of the airspace they are not optimized uh, for minimum fuel consumption. So it is possible to achieve both at the same time. Okay, great. We have a question from Ashley who asks, um, "How do sustainable aviation fuels reduce emissions? You're still burning the fuel and creating CO two emissions." Is it just um, is it just better as recycling the fuel type? Um, he says he's interested to know how this works. Okay, so yeah, just to summarize on how sustainable aviation fuels, like what what are the CO two benefits of like sustainable aviation fuels? Yes, uh, if you burn the fuel, you get the same amount, like similar amounts of CO two emissions relative to a conventional jet fuel. But uh, if you look at it over the life cycle. Life cycle benefits is that when you grow the crop, for example, uh, the crops are eventually converted to fuels. Uh, it absorbs the uh, CO2 in the atmosphere uh, during its lifetime as a crop. Therefore, you get a negative uh, CO2, uh, sort of like an offset uh, in the CO2 emissions when you eventually burn it. So it depends, like the CO2 benefits of like this sustainable aviation fuel, it depends on the crop depends on how you synthesize the fuel and uh, it could reduce the CO life cycle CO2 by, well, you could say 10, it could be as low as 10% or it could be as high as 80 or 90%. And on, uh, on the added benefit is that you could also like uh, reduce the control climate forcing because you have less uh, number particle emissions. Okay, Jeremy Thompson from the British Airline Pilots Association says Balpa are keen to see um, this important effect mitigated as soon as possible. He says what's holding back the regulators is a lack of reliable real world proof of concept study. What should it look like and, and could your team be involved? Uh, yes, we have an ongoing uh, ongoing work to, uh, with the air traffic uh, navigation service provider, uh, the UK ANSB, NATS. So what we want to do is that, yeah, we want to like have some trial flights where we could, uh, yeah, just see if what happens if we uh, move the flight up or down by, well, that's one factor, uh, flight diversion strategy. But we need to validate to see whether how whether if there's a false positive or false negative, whether or not controls that are predicted by the model actually happens. Well, in, in most of the case, the model predicts the uh, control formation phase relatively well. So we have a very high confidence on that, but the uncertainty arises when we uh, when it evolves over time. So we don't uh, we don't know like uh, whether the lifetime, the control lifetime could have a larger uncertainty. And as you can see here in this uh, figure, 
that the uncertainty in the control radiative forcing, the uncertainty is very large relative to the CO2 emissions. So we need to make sure and account for these uncertainties uh, yeah, to make sure that the net climate benefit is a positive one and we do not incur unintended consequences of increasing the CO2 effects. Akshay asks, is it possible to enhance the cooling effect of the contrails, um, for example, by adding additives to the fuels? Uh, okay, if you, we, we see that if you add, if you add like sulfur, uh, the fuel sulfur content, if it increases significantly from about 500 parts per million, as an, uh, I think as a baseline figure, if you increase it up to 6,000 parts per million, uh, just to summarize things that you, the particles uh, tends to be coated with the uh, sulfur, which could repel uh, the water, water vapors, and you could technically form less contrails. But by increasing, there's a study that looked at this, by increasing the fuel sulfur content from 500 to 6,000 parts per million, you only change the contrail formation threshold temperature by one degree. So the effect tends to be very small, and at the same time, we don't want all these unintended consequences of uh, having too much uh, sulfur emissions as well. Okay, there's an anonymous question here um, that says, um, this year seems to be a unique climate pattern. For example, in Cyprus, where uh, the, the questioner lives, the winter has been very unusual. They said uh, they've had a long, um, water snow rich climate pattern resulting in heavy snowfall, rainfall, uh, etc. Could the reduction of flights and contrails, um, obviously due to, to COVID-19, be a contributor to this? And how influential are contrails to the to the change in, in climate patterns? OK, uh, so what, what we've seen here is that the uh, how, how does contrail, con how does contrails affect the radiative forcing? So this is the imbalance in the uh, energy at the top of the atmosphere. But again, like the contrails heat the atmosphere at about, about 10 kilometers above the surface. But it takes time for the heat uh, to travel down and advect down to the surface. So uh, the, the effect tends to be smaller uh, at the surface. And uh, what we've seen here, uh, there's still ongoing studies to look at the COVID effects, uh, to look at the surface temperature changes. If you want to think about it, uh, it could technically, like if we use the models to have a ballpark estimate, it could change the surface temperature by about what 0.01 to 0.1 kelvins. So it's very small uh, within the noise, within the noise of the seasonal and diurnal uh, surface temperature variations in the region. But again, like yes, 0.1 degree sounds very small. But on a grand scheme of things, if we were to limit the uh, Earth surface temperature increase to two degrees to two degrees Celsius, uh, as agreed by the Paris Agreement, then 0.1 percent, a 0.1 degree seems to be uh, a larger problem relative to the absolute values. But yes, uh, back to your question on like if the contrails affect the rain and snow, I would say unlikely. Well, I, I I don't know, but it's unlikely because. These effects tends to happen, the contrary effects tends to happen at the upper troposphere and the lower stratosphere, which is much higher than the clouds that, uh, the height of the clouds that contribute to rain and snow. Great stuff. So um, one other question here, um, and I'm, without seeing the slide, I'm not uh, exactly sure what he's asking, but um, could you please explain why in slide 21, the all contrail forming flights are on average lower than both uh, cooling and warming contrails? That's from Abby. The all, so, uh, sorry, can you repeat this? Yes, so the, um, could you please explain why in slide 21, the all contrail forming flights are on average lower than both cooling and warming contrails? Hmm. Yeah, uh, I don't quite uh, fully understand the question, but I would say that there's a big meteorological dependence in the, uh, so yeah, con the control formation and its climate effects depends strongly on the local atmospheric conditions. Uh, where is it? Yep, here it is. So yeah, you can see the interannual variability can be plus or minus 27%. In 2020, uh, 
we see uh, we tend to see that the controls, uh, the conditions are not favorable in spring of 2020, like during the height of the lockdown. The, yeah, uh, the atmospheric conditions in the North Atlantic are less favorable for control formation relative to earlier years. So that that could make a difference. OK, great. That seems to be all um, of the questions um, that have come in. I'll just give give people another couple of um, seconds just to get any in. Have you had sort of feedback from from the aviation industry on your on your studies? Uh, it's an ongoing engagement. OK, <laughs> yep. good, good. OK, well, um, since there are no other questions, I think we'll leave it there. So thank you very much, uh, Roger, for that really interesting uh, presentation. Before we go, I'll just um, remind everyone that you can find details of our upcoming webinars on the Energy Futures Lab uh, website. And next week, we'll be joined by Dr. Emilio Martinez Paneda, is a senior lecturer in uh, mechanics of materials and he'll present on material degradation challenges in offshore wind, hydrogen storage and lithium ion batteries. Uh, but that is it for today. So thank you again, Roger, and thanks everyone for joining us and have a great afternoon. Thank you for organizing this.